So welcome everyone to Grand Rounds today. Thanks all for coming. Um, I am happy to introduce our very own uh, Lisa Verlet. Um She um, thankfully joined us a number of years ago at the University of Wisconsin after her tour around the United States at various institutions. Um, and now uh, serves as the Doris Beekler Endowed Research Fellow, as well as the Medi Medical Director of Genetic Counseling Services, and um, as one of our GYN oncologists, who we all appreciate her, her talents and expertise um, across the department. Um, um, so without further ado, I'll let Lisa take over um, to discuss uh, blood product utilization, a timely topic for today. Good morning. I assume my audio is okay, but I'll, I'll take um, any criticism of that. Uh, Autumn was kind enough to test it with me prior. Um, this, I couldn't have asked for a better segue than today's M&M, which I actually think when I'm talking about restrictive guidelines for transfusion, I think we're going to really spend a few minutes talking about how obstetrics often um, that just doesn't work. Our patients can lose so much blood so quickly um, that a lot of what I am speaking to today won't be relevant to some of the true, um, the true emergencies that with which we are occasionally faced. That said, I think this is a really interesting topic. I love giving this talk, um, and I haven't given it in a while. So thank you for having me, um, and we will get moving. Um, I do love. Oh, that's funny. It's not letting me advance, which seems very odd. Uh, who can help her out? Autumn or Christy? Um, we just tested this. Yeah, and we it's did. Perfect. Corey, uh, are you on the call? Can you jump in here? Let's think about it. It's giving me some weird thing where it's uh, telling me, says me and Nancy Rich can annotate, and it's letting me annotate my talk, which is like the last one. Oh, for God's sakes. The Here, you know, <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing for a second, guys. Just stay with me. This will take one second, and I bet when I open it again, it's going to be normal. But we'll be okay. We can do this. All right, how are we looking? Do you see guys see an objective slide? Yep. Great, yep, sorry that about that. Good. All right, so we are going to review the rationale behind restrictive use of blood products. Um, we're gonna look at this particularly as it, it uh, pertains to cancer outcomes. Um, immune function may play a role. Is the timing of the transfusion more important than the transfusion itself? and iron infusions to reduce perioperative transfusions in ovarian cancer patients, which is a current research study we have underway. I am not gonna be monitoring the chat function because there's too many things on my screens, but if anyone has a question in real time, Eliza, I'm really happy to be interrupted if someone has a question relevant to a slide that I am on, so feel free to jump in. Um, sometimes it's easiest to ask a question in real time. So I have no disclosures that are relevant to the content I'm presenting today. When I talk about blood today, for the purpose of this talk, I am talking about packed red blood cells. So those are 260 mLs of um, basically centrifuge blood. So whole blood, it consists, as you guys know, of plasma. There's a little buffy coat, which is gonna have your white blood cells and platelets in it, and then your red blood cells. So it's really what happens after this is centrifuged down and the um, plasma is siphoned off. So we use these all the time. You can store them for about 42 days. Um, one unit is gonna raise your hemoglobin by approximately one gram per deciliter. We use a lot of blood. Sometimes I feel like I personally make a dent in our <laughs> county's blood bank with one surgery. Um, but in our country, 36,000 of packed red blood cells are used on the average day. And that's just in our country. Nearly 21 million blood components are transfused each year. The average cost of a packed, a one unit of packed red blood cell is $750. So if you ever want to come up with a staggering statistic, try and think about how much money you have personally spent on blood in a month. If you've been operating a lot, it can be um, quite enormous. Um, we do know that blood transfusions do have significant side effects, um, specifically related to surgical outcome. Infection is more common after transfusion, as is thromboembolism. 
We also know that the blood going into your body, transfused blood, has its own specific transfusion related risks. So we know that people can receive incompatible blood and that can make you unbelievably sick. This is why we'd have so many double checks in place to make sure we are giving the correct blood to the correct patient. These patients can become hypotensive, hypoxic, dyspneic, and can have multi-organ failure and death. There have been some very well-publicized cases of sick patients receiving the wrong blood um, with a variety of tragic outcomes. Less serious, but also pretty darn bad is trolley, which is transfusion-related acute lung injury. It's when patients become hypoxemic and they develop infiltrates, pulmonary infiltrates, a couple hours after transfusion most typically. It's not circulatory overload. It looks and acts a lot like heart failure, but it's different. It's a, it's a lung injury directly related to the blood product rather than fluid overload. These are other things that can happen. You've all seen some version of these things. They are fortunately, for the most part, rare other than the electrolyte abnormalities. But I think we can all agree that blood is something that um, is not without consequence and certainly um, is a precious resource. So thinking before transfusing is a worthwhile endeavor in some situations. So um, a lot has been published on this topic. I'm going to speak to what I feel are a few of the most seminal papers in the last 20 years. Um, this one being published in 1999. Um, so this is really looking, when we think about how blood is used in the U.S., obstetrics does um, certainly use its share, but we really don't transfuse a lot of patients. It's a few patients that need a lot of product. Um, oncology transfuses a lot, but when you think about the big players where you're using 20 units of blood, 30 units of blood, 50 units of blood during a hospitalization, it is trauma patients and cardiac patients, particularly those who need to go on cardiopulmonary bypass. So we're not, um, we're not the biggest users of blood products by any means. So when people were looking at reducing the use of blood products, they started by looking in ICUs and looking in trauma patients and looking in patients admitted to any, uh, for any reason to into the ICU setting. So this study, which was again published more than 20 years ago, looked at patients admitted to tertiary level community ICUs, so not academic centers, and they looked at all cause mortality within 30 days. There was two groups, one was transfused using more restrictive guidelines, which is transfused to a hemoglobin, uh, to keep a hemoglobin of seven, and the other to keep a hemoglobin of more than nine, non-inferiority design. So they hypothesized that the restrictive group would do just as well. And guess what? They did, they actually did a little bit better. So uh, they learned from this that intraoperative transfusion was in fact associated with increased 30-day mortality, increased infection, um, more patients were septic, blood transfusion it was associated with an increased risk of death in a separate population looking at surgical repair of hip fractures, and blood transfusion independent of shock severity is associated with a worse outcome in, of trauma. So these three bullet points came from studies uh, that were done after the New England Journal was published. So it's a big, it's a big deal. Um, and we've learned from looking at trauma patients that actually using more restrictive guidelines can be beneficial and can lead to outcomes that are not just um, non-inferior, but potentially better. So um, there's other ways to study restrictive transfusion. Obviously, um, the most salient way is to randomize patients <laughs> into two groups and try and get a more globalized view. But there are patients who limit the, which blood products will receive and that they will receive. And that was touched on in m, &M. So this is a study that was done in Cleveland Clinic more recent, about eight years old, that included a whole lot of patients who underwent, this was all cardiac surgery. So they looked just back specifically at patients who refuse blood plot products for religious reasons. Um, and so that was a very small, very small number of patients when you think about the whole cohort, but 322 patients to study. And they looked at all kinds of post-surgical outcomes, uh, myocardial infarction, need for second surgery, length of ICU, say mechanical ventilation. Um, and guess what? The patients who weren't transfused did better. Also survived longer, better when your survival. Now, the crux of this question, right, is if you need a transfusion, you're probably sicker and you may have some pre, <laughs> some things that were written long before you ever came in contact with the hospital or the blood bank that might make you more prone to have worse outcomes. And that really, um, 
boils down to the fundamental question that I'm trying to answer, which is, is it, is it the transfusion or is it the patient that actually portends these worse, worse outcomes? And that is a very challenging thing to tease out. Um, so this is an other group of heavy transfusions, cardiac surgeons, and these are all patients. So the patients included in this study, again, this was an open uh, label non-inferiority trial. So there was five, more than 5,000 patients included cardiac surgery. Um, they had to be having a big surgery. So undergoing cardiac surgery that included cardiopulmonary bypass. So these were not small procedures. The restrictive transfusion group was held at a hemoglobin of 7.5. So they were only transfused once their hemoglobin was less than seven and a half. Whereas a liberal transfusion group uh, was allowed to, um, to receive blood at 9.5. This is what it looked like. So I think this graph is important because it shows the average hemoglobin throughout hospitalization in both groups. The orange is the restrictive threshold. The blue is the liberal threshold. So in an intent to treat model, this is really important. Did they actually do what they said they were going to do? Where the uh, patients who are randomized to have more restrictive levels of hemoglobin, meaning they need to have a much lower hemoglobin to get transfused, were they actually maintaining those lower levels? And they were. Their average hemoglobin was definitely quite a bit lower than the group that was transfused at um, once they reached a hemoglobin less than 9.5. What they learned from this is that the death from any cause was essentially equal, 11.4% versus 12.5%. So um, again, pointing in favor of restrictive transfusion being safe and responsible. When we think about obstetrics, it is understudied. So, and that's probably the right thing. In general, patients in obstetrics are gonna need blood. When we lose blood in obstetrics, it tends to happen very quickly. Um, and it tends to, it's not always clear how quickly that bleeding is going to stop. So things like the massive transfusion product protocol are more than appropriate. And certainly um, when I talk about restrictive transfusion, the whole overarching theme here is in a patient who is stable and not having active bleeding. So many of our obstetrics patients are um, not gonna fall into that category. As a result, like many things in obstetrics, restrictive transfusion is understudied. Um, as I say here, pop, this is a population that usually needs blood. Um, and the other piece of this, right, is that we're now asking this patient to care for a tiny human, right, and potentially breastfeed. So you really are not going to want someone walking around with a hemoglobin of seven holding um, and trying to breastfeed a new seven-pound baby. That's fairly miserable. Um, so I think there's a lot of unique circumstances that make blood often the right intervention. That said, we do have some data suggesting that peripartum transfusions um, are associated with maternal morbidity, including ICU admissions, longer hospitalizations, increased healthcare utilization in general, and lower breastfeeding feeding rates. I think this does speak to those patients being sicker at baseline, um, but there probably are instances where a stable postpartum patient with a hemoglobin between eight and nine might not need a second unit of blood, where we can be considering a one unit uh, transfusion um, standard, uh, particularly a patient who's not symptomatic and appears well. So um, when this was studied, one of the best studies was in the UK, and they were really aiming to um, limit transfusion from two units to one unit in the postpartum population. Again, the non-actively bleeding postpartum population. So when they looked at the transfusion data from 1988 to 2000, about 6% of patients who receive a blood transfusion in the postpartum period uh, received one unit and almost 94% received two units. Then they did this huge nationwide education initiative to try and get um, physicians and other providers to keep hemoglobins, um, to be comfortable with a hemoglobin as low as seven without um, assuming, of course, that there was no threat of ongoing bleeding. When they re-examined their data, more than a decade later, 92% of patients received hemoglobins. <coughs> so this was not a successful intervention, um, and there's probably a lot of reasons behind that, um, but it is really difficult. And these are our longstanding habits that, um, patients have and we want our patient and we, that physicians have and we want our patients to feel well um, blood can often do that so this is just one example of an attempt to intervene that was not that did not um, go as well as one had hoped I, I understand that you're not going to be able to see this well this is there for your reference you guys will have access to these slides or this talk um, but really this is about the data that forms our um, American Association of Blood 
Bank's recommendations. It was published in 2016. The table comments on the quality of the evidence used to establish these guidelines, um, and they include all the RCTs that compare restrictive versus liberal transfusion. And this is really where we get the hemoglobin of seven as the goal um, for restrictive transfusion. So, this is kind of an old reference now, but hopefully someone knows still knows this song. Um, no, not all blood is bad. Um, and certainly transfusions are going to be indicated much of the time, but I think there are situations where we give blood too liberally and cancer is probably one of them. So these are the accepted transfusion guidelines. Um, in general, seven is the cutoff that in a stable patient should be considered. If you have a patient with an acute coronary sim syndrome and, or other very real cardiac morbidity, there is some data supporting that eight would be the better cutoff. Um, and that makes sense. Uh, certainly uh, tissue demand is part of what goes into the equation of how much blood is needed in the circulatory system and an unhealthy heart is going to need more O2 to function normally. When we started to look at this in our population, and when I say our population, I mean my population, the ovarian cancer population, we learned a lot of things about anemia and anemia in current practice. So our patients um, coming in with a new ovarian cancer diagnosis are very likely to be anemic, particularly if they've received neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So the graph here just talks about the patients walking in the door for their preoperative visit for their primary debulking surgery. If we've elected to take them to the OR first, the majority of those patients are not anemic. But after three cycles of chemotherapy, guess what? The neoadjuvant group, almost everyone is. Two, well, three quarters of patients are anemic at the time of surgery. And not a lot of those patients were anemic at diagnosis, 40%, so some, but that increases to 77%. So that means that there's this huge, huge increase in anemia for obvious reasons. We give agents that are myelosuppressive. So we're causing anemia and then taking them for these big surgeries. This seems like a very um, obvious opportunity to intervene and potentially make anemia better in patients before they go to the OR, thereby reducing their risk for blood transfusion. So we also know that um, the more, <laughs> the more like the more anemic you are, the more likely you are to be transfused. So our neoadjuvant patients are much more likely to be transfused than our primary debulking patients. So this this anemia and, and transfusion are inherently linked. Now, is there a unique harm done to cancer patients when they are given blood? I, the the real answer is I'm not sure, but probably. And we'll talk about what we know about other solid tumors um, besides ovarian cancer and how um, transfusion may be a bad actor. So a ton of different solid tumors here, colon cancer, gastric cancer, ovarian cancer, all of these patients um, did worse if they were transfused. So preoperative anemia, even without transfusion and gastric anemia in gastric cancer portends a worse prognosis. Um, in colon cancer, where many, many patients are anemic at diagnosis, um, it negatively affects survival. Um, in ovarian cancer, low hemoglobin has been associated with prognostic relevance. Um, so we just, this is a piece of the equation, but are the patients just sicker to begin with? Um, or is transfusion making a bad situation worse? Maybe a little bit of both. So it's really difficult to determine if there is an independent effect of blood transfusion. Most of the data that's been published is observational studies, not interventional studies. And there's gonna be a lot of variation in how practitioners uh, use blood and transfuse blood. In general, patients who are transfused are going to have more advanced disease. They may have undergone bigger surgeries with higher blood loss and have other comorbidities. So those transfusions just may simply be necessary. In cancer surgeries, this has been studied with, I think, a little bit more control. So when you look at murine or mouse tumor models, um, you can have a lot of control about um, the perioperative factors that are affecting the, the mouse, right? You have a lot of control about the mouse's environment. And even in a very controlled setting, just the act of transfusing the blood was a significant risk factor for tumor progression. And the closer it was to sur surgery, the worst the patient, the mouse, <laughs> did. And this, this is actually the work that really piqued my interest because now this is kind of the classic setting in ovarian cancer. We have patients who are going to very likely to be anemic at huge risk for blood transfusion and the surgeries we do to them are huge and have an uh, enormous amount of cytokine release um, and enormous effects on the immune system. And could it be that it's the immune modulation or some changes that are happening 
to the immune system surrounding surgery that actually make transfusion around that time point so risky or so, you know, have these potential long term sequelae. The, similar with hepatocellular carcinoma and lung cancer. So these are specific to patients who underwent surgery. The transfusions, and these were big, big studies, were all um, associated with. Uh, increase in all-cause mortality and in the lung cancer patient earlier recurrence. So um, we do know that there is, this is documented even outside of cancer patients, TRIM, which is transient immunosuppression, um, which occurs after blood transfusion. So it's partially attributed to the presence of donor white blood cells releasing cytokines. So the white blood cells that are coming into the donors, excuse me, the recipient's body can have a transient effect on the immune system. We do uh, here at UW and at most big institutions, leukoreduce, reduce, meaning though as many donor white blood cells are removed from the donor blood as possible. So that can attenuate trim, but it doesn't eliminate it. And trim is a very well documented phenomenon. So when you think about, um, immunosuppression at the time of transfusion, that is a real thing, both in and outside of the cancer population. Um, so a lot of the studies that I've shown you already today did not comment on whether the blood had been cytoreduced, and that may be a piece of the issue. For the data coming out of our institution, all the blood has been cytoreduced. So we've maximized our opportunity to reduce this transient immune suppression. So this is a little schematic about what we think is happening. Um, Basically, a lot of changes to the immune system happen transiently during surgery, and most of these have to do with an increase in inflammation and a decrease in macrophage, monocyte, and natural killer cell activity. So some of the things we count on to um, prevent postoperative infection, to limit um, limit intra-abdominal exposure to bacteria or other outside outside factors, a lot of those things are not working uh, normally during, during surgery. And then when you add blood into the mix, it's further suppressed. And I would argue if when you add cancer to the mix, your immune system wasn't operating normally when you walked in the door with your diagnosis. So there's a lot of competing interests here that are making the immune system work less well. Um, again, I'm not going to go through this table, which I understand is huge, but this is basically a summary of all right red blood cell transfusion studies and patient outcome after cancer surgeries. So we have now multiple types of solid tumor, pancreatic, colorectal, prostate, renal, gastric, hepatocellular, and bladder cancers, where um, huge studies, thousands of patients, so, you know, one of them as large as 50,000 patients showing worse cancer outcomes uh, when correcting for other factors related to blood transfusion. So I think this is real, and we wanted to learn more about what was happening to our patients here at UW. So we looked at patients who, again, ovarian cancer diagnosis, and just looked at patients who were transfused perioperatively. We used the window of within 72 hours of surgery. So that could include an intraoperative transfusion, someone who we noticed you know, uh, was anemic the day prior and received blood, um, and certainly the postoperative transfusions that are very frequent on our floor. What we learned, uh, not surprisingly, patients who received transfusions were more likely to have a higher preoperative CA125, so presumably a higher disease burden. They were more likely to have received neoadjuvant chemotherapy, which makes sense, um, higher EBL, and more likely to be anemic. So these all are intuitive. What's interesting um, is that the optimal debulking rate was similar and the stages of the cancer were similar, as well as BMI age. So some of the, the things that we, I thought maybe would be happening more in the transfused group, like an older, more frail or less healthy population that wasn't as apparent. Um, when we look at this, we look at the median survival for women who were not transfused um, versus those who were. And again, these were all leukoreduced reduced transfusions. So you can see here that the patients who were not transfused, we actually haven't even reached the median survival endpoint yet. And this is the last time we looked at this data was last year. So they are doing a lot better now, many, many factors, but it's hard to ignore this. And this is, um, we did do this with a multivariate analysis. So look, correcting for stage, correcting for um, grade of cancer, correcting for optimal debulking status. The other things that we know are a big deal for, for survival were taken into account when we did this analysis. So we really are trying to tease out the transfusion piece of this as um, carefully as we can. So we think 
um, perioperative blood transfusions might actually be the biggest culprit. And if there's anything that we could potentially reduce, it could be this. Um, we know that they're associated with worse survival in ovarian cancer patients, and there's a few publications listed here that support that. Um, and again, this is most of these were within 72 hours of surgery um, with the perioperative window. One of them just looked at intraoperative transfusion, and one of them was within 48 hours of surgery. But in general, perioperative is the 72 hour mark. Um, there was one publication that refuted this, and it actually came out of the institution where I trained. And it's uh, uh, Mike Worley is uh, was one of my co-fellows. So it's clearly someone who I don't think. Well, he's he's a very smart guy. So um, he looked at their data and did not um, find any difference in survival in the new adjuvant population. So there was 270 patients, not huge, but not nothing. Um, they adjusted for age, stage, and optimal reduction or residual disease, and they did not notice any difference in survival if they were transfused at any point during their hospitalization. So this isn't perfect because it's not a true perioperative um, transfusion, but certainly most patients are were transfused within 72 hours. So one of the things that I think we can do is think about reducing transfusions in ovarian cancer patients. It's probably a good idea from a resource utilization standpoint and from a cancer outcome standpoint, probably makes sense to do this. So we know that restrictive transfusion protocols can work. They didn't work in the UK in the obstetric population, but they've worked in the trauma populations. They've worked in the cardio um, pulmonary population. So there's no reason to think we can't do it here. Um, there is pretty high compliance, um, and we talked a lot about single unit strategies. So not saying, hey, you can't have any blood, but maybe start with one unit. When you're tempted to transfuse, start with one unit and see how the patient does before giving the second. The other piece of this, which we'll get more into, is attempting to treat anemia and iron deficiency before surgery. And certainly in patients getting neoadjuvant chemotherapy, you have a unique opportunity to identify anemia well before surgery is planned. So our group in 2018, uh, wanted to work on this, um, and we did. So the Gynox agreed to restrictive transfusion, meaning that in a stable patient without evidence of active bleeding, that we would try to not transfuse until their hemoglobin got less than seven. We collected data over six months um, and all just worked hard and worked with our residents and worked with our APPs on being a little bit more restrictive with how blood was, was given. We were able in a six month period to decrease the number of transfusions from 15 to eight, so almost cut it in half. And the median number of units per transfusion decreased successfully from two to one. So instead of 35% of patients getting one unit, 83% of patients got one unit. We also look back in this time period before and after we um, implemented restrictive transfusion and learned that there was no difference in infectious complications, cardiac, VTE, and GI events. So patients did just the same. Um, we're still, now we have more data because so, it's gone on for longer and we have certainly more complication data to include. So we are um, redoing this uh, to, to get a little bit more of a complete picture, but I would say this was a very successful intervention and actually our trainees uh, really made it happen. So I'm very proud that we were able to do this for our patients. Um, this is a common question. Why no um, EPO? So in cancer, sorry, I just want to make sure I didn't skip a slide. Nope. Um, so EPO is uh, erythropoiesis stimulating agents. And this is a very um, common thing to be done in liquid tumors like leukemias. Um, and it's a very effective way of raising red blood cell counts. So we we're talking a lot about how can we avoid transfusion? We're talking a lot about a uh, population receiving chemotherapy. Why can't we, you know, when someone has low white blood cells, we are more than happy to give them a granulocyte colony stimulating factor. Why are we not doing the same thing with red cells? And we've learned that, especially with solid tumors, it is not a good idea to give erythropoietin. It increases morbidity and mortality and most significantly increases DBTs uh, by a lot. So that's the main reason that it's avoided. Um, it can also exhibit anti-apatotic effects. That's in vitro work, but it makes some sense that you might actually be inhibiting some of the cytotoxic chemotherapy you're giving. And we know that some cancers, including ovarian cancer, uh, express receptors for erythropoietin, so it really actually may stimulate their growth. So this is still being studied, but this would be a very obvious question to ask is can't we do, can't we just make our bone marrow work harder to prevent anemia and thereby prevent transfusion in these patients? 
Um, let's talk a little bit about iron in cancer patients, because you can tell that anemia and transfusion are inherent inherently linked um, and iron deficiency and anemia are also inherently linked. So this is kind of the next step in the cause and effect journey. So iron deficiency is very common in many cancer patients and sometimes it's iron deficiency with anemia and sometimes it's iron deficiency without anemia. So true iron deficiency is when your ferritin is very low. Functional iron deficiency, which used to be called anemia of chronic disease, is when your ferritin is actually normal. And in some cancers, it's elevated because ferritin can be an acute phase reactant, but your iron saturation is low. So you have the iron, but you're not using it correctly. And that's the type of iron deficiency that happens a lot in ovarian cancer, we think. It's understudied, but that's what we're trying to figure out a little bit better. Colon cancers or other cancers where the tumors bleed tend to have true iron deficiency anemia. They're actually coming in, they may well have a tumor that's bleeding, they're gonna have low ferritin stores. Um, our cancers behave differently. So we know this, um, that pro-inflammatory cytokines are part of what leads to functional iron functional deficiency or this anemia of chronic disease. It's part of the same cascade that I think can be particularly troublesome during surgery is the inflammatory cytokines shorten red cell survival. It's gonna impair EPO release, which is something that our bone marrow does make normally. And you're not gonna have normal erythropoiesis. You're also not gonna have iron that's able to get to where it's supposed to be effectively. So, we don't really know how common iron deficiency in ovarian cancer patients is because it's very understudied. We're trying to get that to the answer to that question now. So when we see our ovarian cancer patients walk in with their new diagnosis, if they're anemic, we're trying very hard to get iron studies on those patients to see who has true iron deficiency anemia and who has anemia of chronic disease or functional iron deficiency anemia. The hypothesis we have though is we think a lot of these patients are not gonna be anemic, but will be iron deficient. And that makes sense. You probably become iron deficient before you become anemic. So that's maybe the opportunity to actually intervene the most effectively. If you have iron defici deficiency without anemia, your EPO is still working. And if you can maybe boost up those iron stores more effectively, potentially you can prevent the anemia from occurring. We do know that oral iron has been studied in ovarian cancer patients. If, uh, many of you have worked with ovarian cancer patients and know that GI symptoms are incredibly common, particularly at diagnosis. Anyone who's taken oral iron knows that it can be really hard on your stomach and that it, it can cause quite a bit of GI upset. So in studying oral iron in ovarian cancer patients, often compliance has been the biggest issue. Um, so IV iron has actually been studied quite a bit and shown to be more effective because the compliance is better. And that's true in the colorectal literature too. So this um, is a placebo controlled RCT. Um, it was published in Ghana in 2013. So these are all ovarian cancer patients, 20, 64 patients, no iron studies performed, which I'll never understand, but that's okay. Um, and they received iron sucrose infusions after each chemotherapy session. And this was compared to the other group that got oral ferrous fumarate, 200 milligrams three times a day. And you can see that in terms of hemoglobin levels, the IV iron group did quite a bit better and post-treatment really rebounded to near normal levels quite a bit more quickly. So this study had some flaws. I would have designed it a little bit differently, but I think it does speak to um, oral iron being challenging for our patients and perhaps not the most effective way to intervene. So um, these are the adverse events listed in this study. Um, oral iron on the left, IV iron on the right, um, nausea more common uh, with the oral iron and constipation a lot more common. And again, these are things that our patients are struggling with anyway. To, so to add to those, symptom, to those symptoms, to that umbrella of symptoms is not particularly tempting. Um, I think it's unrealistic. Certainly oral iron can be trialed in our patients um, who maybe don't have as much bulky disease or ascites, but I think it's unrealistic to assume that an ovarian cancer patients can maintain oral therapeutic doses of oral iron longer term. So when we think about intervening using IV options, there's a couple. Iron dextrin is probably the most commonly used. Um, it gets a bad rap because it can have a pretty significant anaphylactic infusion reaction. Very rare, um, 
but real. So you do have to monitor these patients carefully. Uh, right now, there's a nationwide shortage. So in terms of things we were considering studying, it was very easy to decide not to study iron dextran because it's very hard to get. Iron sucrose was the agent used in the study I just discussed. Um, it is effective. It much uh, much less likely to cause anaphylaxis. Um, the transfusion reactions that are reported are typically very mild, but it does require multiple doses. So iron dextran, you can really give someone a huge slug of it and raise their iron stores significantly. Um, with iron sucrose, you need to intervene. You have to give 200 milligram doses at least three or four times to truly combat iron deficiency. We know these um, agents are safe. There's no known risk, even in cancer patients of CV uh, events, cardiovascular events, respiratory, VT, GI side effects, very low rates of discontinuation, um, very safe. Um, both, both of these are very safe and very efficacious. So our hypothesis, and this is Dr. Janelle Sebecki's thesis, is that I, IV iron sucrose infusions when given to the iron deficient patient during neoadjuvant chemotherapy, again, these are ovarian cancer patients, is going to decrease perioperative blood transfusions at the time of their interval debulking surgery. So advanced stage ovary cancer, and that's really the neoadjuvant population. These are patients who we anticipate doing a surgery after three cycles. They are not anemic, but they are iron deficient. So they're either gonna have a low ferritin but a normal hemoglobin, that's pretty rare, or an elevated or normal fer ferritin and a low iron saturation. So again, that's that anemia, that functional iron deficiency. So what we do to these patients is that they meet eligibility criteria and sign consent, they receive a total of four IV iron sucrose infusions. So 200 milligrams each prior to surgery. We've tried to line these up with times patients are coming to see us anyway. So two of the infusions can be given after their taxol carboplatin chemotherapy. It's about a 60 minute event. It's not super long, so you can tack that on to the end. The other two infusions are given to coincide with their day 10 labs. And although many of many patients would typically get those labs closer to home, we have been able to um, make it pretty easy for them to come into our infusion center, get their labs drawn, and then be hooked up to iron for, again, just under an hour. So we're, our primary endpoint is the rate of perioperative blood transfusion, defined as transfusion of packed red blood cells within 72 hours of their interval debulking surgery. And we anticipate a 30% decrease in blood transfusion rates when iron deficient patients are given iron. Uh, we're also gonna look at the rate of iron deficia, deficiency without anemia in this population. So we know very little about that. Um, and I think that will, that finding alone is probably going to be worth a, a poster um, and also determine how effective we are at re resolving iron deficiency after subjects receive this infusion. So not just reducing blood transfusion, but did we actually increase their iron stores and what does that look like? So we are repeating iron studies um, prior to their surgery to get not just the baseline, but the preoperative um, values of what their iron stores look like. So this is a schema. Um, in the patients without anemia, um, those are the ones we just talked about. They're consented to draw iron studies for research purposes. What we are trying to do with the patients who have anemia on the left are just learn more standard of care about um, what their iron stores look like. So are they iron deficient or non-iron deficient? Um, it's just really underpublished. So we are in general just trying to learn more about anemia and iron deficiency in our patients. Um, I do think there's a lot more we can do here. I'm very proud that um, we've, we're enrolling patients at the, in the study, and I think it's a total of four patients who have gone through um, and received their iron sucrose infusions. Um, there's many more that are receiving them for anemia, which I think is actually a really appropriate intervention that we were underutilizing previously. But now we need to do more. So I think the next piece of this to study is what is actually happening to the immune system. Um, surrounding surgery and particularly in patients who are receiving blood compared to those who aren't. Fortunately, we have several geniuses in our midst. Um, Dr. Alex Stanek is one of them, and he does a lot of work on the immune transcriptome. So he can actually take a snapshot of um, looking at patients. You can look at, in this case, it was peritoneal implantation of tumor cells. So in this case, these are cancer cells. But you can look at blood and see what the immune system is doing at any given moment. You can look at what the monocytes are doing, if the NK cells are active, what's going on with your T cells, your CD4s, your plasma cells. You can figure out what the immune system thinks of its current state. And I think that um, 
this is a unique opportunity um, to learn more about what happens to the immune system of our patients surrounding blood transfusion, particularly in the perioperative setting, and learn more about the potential long-term effects of that intervention. So I'm excited. We are looking for funding for this project. I hope we will get be successful in getting that um, because I think this is really getting to the heart of the question we'd like to answer, which is, are we harming patients by giving them blood? And is it changing the way their immune system functions surrounding surgery, putting them at risk for uh, being unable to combat their cancer as effectively? Um, so to summarize, we know that restrictive transfusion guidelines make sense in a lot of situations across a number of disciplines. We also know that obstetrics in many cases will be an exception to this, where blood is just going to be the most appropriate intervention. We know that ovarian cancer patients are often anemic and are very likely to require blood transfusions fusions during their treatment course. Anemia, blood transfusion, inflammation, and surgery may create a perfect storm of immune suppression that has been shown to potentially worsen cancer outcomes. And that IV iron supplementation during neoadjuvant chemotherapy is a unique opportunity to potentially reduce blood transfusion rates in this population. A lot of people help with this. This is like the top five, but the Division of GYN Oncology in the Department of OB GYN, as well as Dolores Beekler, who has been a very generous supporter of my research, should also be commended for their efforts. Uh, Janelle, I don't know if she's on this call, has done so much work on our prospective study, and I'm really excited to um, to see that be published and see that work come to fruition. Uh, Manish and Joe Connor have been the biggest um, help in the lab in getting this work moving. And Andrea O'Shea, who is a previous fellow, um, help, was a co-author on most of the publications I shared. Do the seeds. Um, that's it, guys. Any questions? I can't. I, I'll try and open up the chat box um, without totally screwing up my screen. But uh, feel free to um, ask anything. And thanks for your attention. Although you could all be asleep, I have no idea. So if, if anyone has questions, you can enter it into the chat box. Uh, Lisa, I have a question for you. Are there validated uh, like algorithms um, out there to determine you know, who would benefit most from a, a post-operative transfusion? Yeah, there are, and there are. Uh, um, population specific, unsurprisingly. So I, the best um, guidelines in our hospital are actually in the CCU, so in the cardiac critical care unit. They have some very helpful templates for what uh, clinical parameters you should use for transfusion. But in general, they really are asking us to use common sense. Like, hey, is this patient, are they tachycardic? <laughs> are they hypoxic? Because if the answer to those questions are yes, can they stand up without falling over? I mean, you still need to like use your clinical judgment and transfuse the symptomatic patient. Um, but in a stable patient, the guidelines are pretty clear for almost everything that uh, between seven and eight is the is where you can really expect most most patients to be comfortable, safe, and asymptomatic, and that should be our target. Um, and then if you transfuse them to there and they are not <laughs> asymptomatic and they are not able to walk without feeling um, orthostasis, then, you know, they're a different, everyone's different and you give them that second unit. But it, the, all the algorithms look, actually end up looking pretty similar. Okay. And then what about use of iron uh, transfusions in the post-operative period? Yeah, so not studied a lot in cancer, studied more in OB actually. So um, there is an opportunity to add more obstetric data to this talk, and I will do that before I give it next. But a lot of it is tiny, tiny studies, you know, case kind of, kind of case report work where patients who lost quite a bit of blood postpartum and are coming in, you know, still not super anemic, but their hemoglobins are hanging out eight or nine, and if IV iron can be helpful in that setting. It does it still takes a few weeks to work, and so I think in the postpartum population, it's less tempting to do that because you just want your patients to feel they're up against enough stuff, right? They're not sleeping. Um, they got a screaming child. So I think it, that uh, the practical use of IV iron and asking patients to come in for IV iron infusion in the postpartum period is just a lot more challenging. Do yeah. I think it would work? Yeah, I do. I think it would work pretty well. And we have increased our use of, of post-op and postpartum IV iron. <clears throat> I think that's awesome. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think if the only thing that comes out of this work is if we're using more IV iron, even in just patients who are frankly anemic before their ovarian cancer surgeries, I think that's progress. And I think the progress we've made as a group for really trying to give one unit in the post-operative or kind of during chemo period um, has been meaningful too. Yeah. So I don't see any questions. Um, so we'll give a last call here. <laughs> If anybody has anything, just type it in the chat or unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. I have a, a quick question, this is Katie Sampani. Um, I had a patient recently who we were giving IV iron sucrose for um, antenatally, and she had what appeared to be a pretty clear reaction to the sucrose. Um, and a couple of hours after, it was after though, like about two or so hours after she developed symptoms, like a full body myalgias mm -hmm. um, and pain. Um, and I had actually never, never seen that before and was curious. We um, just did some lit review and things and found it and ended up using um, IV solumedrol and she responded, you know, within like 12 hours or so to that and went home and was fine. But I was just wondering, what I was having difficulty finding was like the natural history of these reactions. So mm -hmm. if you give it, um, what, how long are you expecting that to last if you just wait it out versus wait, you know, giving a burst of steroids? I was just w wondering if anyone else had more data or experience with um, treating those types of reactions as we give it more and more. Yeah, I that's um that's a pretty unusual time course that you're describing. I I'm sure it was iron related, and I think you handled that perfectly. Um, and how we're handling, we check on our patients. Obviously, the, in the infusion center, we are asking them specific questions um, about trans about. Re infusion reactions and then they get a phone call within two days of their transfusion so they get infusion so they get another opportunity to tell us side effects we haven't had anyone describe things like that so my experience is uh the same is less than yours frankly because it's reading the literature but people do describe those myalgias and i think of them almost um i mean Steroid works so, so well for those. Even uh, a slug of Benadryl can help a ton if they happen a little more rapidly. Um, but I do think uh, talking to patients to call if they're experiencing things like that so we can dose them, even with a Medrol dose pack can be really helpful. Thanks. And there was, you know, we were reading um, something and I'd have to pull the literature again to look at it, but there was like some concern. We actually didn't give the Benadryl because there was some concern about that causing some kind of a flare. It, it, that's not something that you have actually. Uh, but the only time um, I've used Benadryl is when something's happening fairly immediately. Like the iron goes in and the patient's like, I'm a little itchy. I feel like something's yeah. wrong. So yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't think Benadryl would have been appropriate that far out because then you're you're probably having a more delayed hypersensitivity experience. Yeah. Yeah, interesting, thanks. I see a question from Manish in the chat, which says, is there a way to save blood samples from donors? I don't think we can even trace where blood donors come from. I've never thought to explore that. That's a really good question. I think where he's going with that question is, can we learn more about the immune system of the people who ha are donating the blood? Yeah, that's right, uh, Lisa. And I realize it would be difficult, but it would be nice to look at the immune system and even like things like MHC, you know, class one mm -hmm. molecules and mismatch there with the patients. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah I, it's it's I, really typing, basically. I think what you're, I mean, the best way to do that, right, is to not transfuse the entire unit and to save. You know, the last so, CCs yeah. for research, I, it's a, I, I don't know that the IRB would love that suggestion <laughs> when you've decided <laughs> to transfuse somebody, but I like where you're going with that. And I wonder if there is a way to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if any of the residents on the call would speak to their experience in ordering uh, blood using more restrictive guidelines on F66. And if there's been um, concern from nursing staff or if there's been how uh, there's many residents who've probably watched this whole transition happen when we were routinely giving two units to now giving more routinely one um, 
and it's just if there are any comments in that transition. I, of course, thought it went really smoothly, but I'm not the one who's <laughs> entering all the orders and, and working on the floor, dealing with them. Um, other people's opinions. Lisa? Yeah. Yeah, this is Gloria Sarto. Hi, how are you? I'm doing pretty well. Uh, but I'm just thinking after all these years of transfusing people the way we've been doing it, how long is it going to take to get that to be a relatively surgeon, which is so important, to be just an accepted treatment rather than giving the blood transfusions as we've been doing all these years. Yeah, it's going to take a long time. Yeah. It's very hard to change practice. I mean, we all have we all have our habits and I'll have how we were trained and blood works, right? And we don't see enough negative consequences of blood transfusion to be truly afraid of it. Uh -huh. Oh, it's interesting. Wonderful work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, this is Jenny Karnowski. Um, so at uh, my last job, they changed um, like about maybe three or four years ago, they changed the um, transfusion protocol in the way that the orders were placed. And that if you wanted to give more than one unit, you had to specify a reason. Mm -hmm. That little like extra step um, pretty much made everyone just order one unit at a time unless they had really good reasons. Um, and they showed data um, from that in single institution of like um, pretty much like a 95% uh, uptake of just of single unit transfusions throughout the hospital. That's um, awesome. And they dropped like their overall transfusion by a ton. Uh, so I wasn't sure if the residents for, because I haven't ordered blood at UW in a long time, uh, if that's how the order set looks or it's just you can put in as many units as you want. It is a well. I want. I really do want one of you residents. My gosh, I can't believe how quiet you're being. Um, should really comment because my experience is it's not quite that. It's not like that. It's not like a. Are you sure you want two units? But you do have to enter specific criteria for why you're transfusing blood, and it is a little bit harder to get more blood. It's not an absolute stop like that, though. I would agree with what Dr. Barlett says. When we put it in a transfusion order, um, the computer calculator or Epic calculates what they think we should be transfusing based on the patient's hemoglobin and the goal that we select. And if you would like to give more than they, uh, the, the the calculation, you have to put in a justification for that. What we didn't want was it to be, because we know that sometimes you just need blood. And uh, I, we did not want to create um, a situation where it would be onerous to get the blood you need quickly. Um, but I do think those, like, the more annoying it is to order more blood, right? We're very, we are very good at avoiding things in Epic that are annoying and we'll go to great, to great lengths to do so. So it's great to hear. I think that's a really effective intervention. Uh, Jenny, that you're describing at your previous institution. Yeah, it worked really well. And they didn't show any like worsening patient yeah. outcome. That's, that's been the most compelling part of this is it's been studied enough that you just, there's, I, I cannot think of any well-designed study where they've showed worse patient outcomes. And that's the piece of this that I think is really compelling. And it saved the institution a lot of money, which uh, during these times seems to be compelling as well. Shannon just sent me a, a message in the chat box, I think just came to me, but she sa is saying the blood bank actually called to request ordering two unit transfusion rather than one in a patient whose hemoglobin was 5.3, but otherwise sim asymptomatic. Yeah, I think they were probably using the, hey, you're never going to get this patient to seven, and you probably should aim to get a patient to seven. That depends, though. It also depends on how chronically anemic that patient was. If that patient had been walking around life with a hemoglobin of six for three months, and some patients do that, um, maybe the one unit that, that was appropriate. I've had very good luck calling the blood bank when I'm in a when when they don't like what I'm doing, um, and talking to them and explaining my rationale. And sometimes they do uh, gently correct me and have really compelling reasons for their suggestions. And sometimes they think what I'm saying makes sense for that particular patient. Yeah, Cynthia just made a nice comment in chat. Mm 
Yeah, and I think that massive transfusion is obviously going to be a totally different thing. Once that is activated, and now it sounds like it's very easy to activate, which is great, um, nobody should be asking any questions about blood. You should be getting all the product you need as quickly as you need it. And Maddie just made a comment about uh, once resistance, experiencing resistance from nursing, but once we pulled up the study showing restrictive criteria is better, they were very receptive. Thank you for pulling up that data. That's awesome. And I have, I have given a very short version of this talk to the nurses on F66, which I think was helpful, but of course, no talk like that has perfect attendance with everyone's schedule. Okay, do we have any more questions? Seems like people are getting quiet. So <laughs> thanks thank for your you, attention, Lisa. everyone. It's so different. I really like it better when we're all in the same room. That's my <laughs> that's my wish for 2021 when I give grand rounds next. My wish as well. Thank you so much, Lisa. Have this a good day, everyone. Talk. Bye.